things that we want to um, incorporate into the discussion so that everybody's seeing, you know, the top left is essentially the Arctic vortex, which I'm sure you guys remember fondly, especially now that it's summertime. Um, bottom right is the Nor'easters. Um, there's that actually a section of a section of situate where they've been losing about 40 to 60 houses every year. So when we start thinking about what's going on right now with climate change impacts and the vulnerability, we have to start thinking about not only um, more extreme um, events happening, so higher tides, more rain, but we also have to recognize that these things are going to be happening. Um, you may remember last summer when we had those massive heat waves um, up here. It was 105 degrees in sections of uh, New Hampshire and Vermont and, and um, definitely down in New Boston and New York. On the bottom right is the kind of things that you have. There was a transformer fire. Um, the transformer essentially blew up, caught fire, took out power for all downtown Boston for about three days. So these are the sorts of things that we're seeing more and more. You guys probably remember those from uh, Hurricane Irene up here. Those are pictures from um, up around here. And this was not supposed to be a massive storm. It was not supposed to hit Vermont at all. And one of the things they really did is reminded us all um, of how massive natural forces can really be. But then we realized that sometimes we also kind of do things for ourselves. I and mean, that's um, uh, Lower Manhattan after Hurricane Sandy. And that's the Empire State Building was the only building with any power. And a lot of it was because there were things, the ways in which our systems are connected are such that when something goes down, that failure propagates through a lot of the interdependent systems. That picture on the bottom, that's uh, Boston this winter. There was a water main break during the snowstorm, and one of the sand trucks fell in the gap because the water main washed away the soil. The um, sand truck fell in there. It took them about two days to get the uh, sand trunk out of the hole before they could actually repair the water main. So, um, so I'm starting off really cheerful, uh, but this is one of the things that, that yeah, this is the happy part. This is the happy part. <laughs> so one of the things that most people don't realize is that these costs are escalating over time. And this is just U.S. weather disasters. This excludes all man-made disasters, you know, bridge failures or massive fires or um, uh, attacks. Um, and it's only the United States, right? And so what we're seeing is the cost of these disasters is going up over time. Part of it is we have more and more people living in places that are vulnerable. And we also are seeing these kind of propagating failures through different systems. So it's not just that one thing breaks, it's like one thing breaks and then it takes down everything else with it. So one of the things that, that I do a lot of and, and that Jim and I are going to talk about tonight is the ways in which um, communities <coughs> and organizations can really start addressing the issues of resiliency and really start moving forward. And one of the advantages we have is that a lot of the activities that we've all been doing and that Yes Tomorrow and most of the community that's been associated with community, the Yes Tomorrow has been doing for many years is what's now called sustainability, which is really looking at the social justice, the economic opportunity, the environmental regeneration. And one of the things that, that I really emphasize to communities and organizations is that is momentum along the same way. A lot of those things that we've been doing actually improve our resilience. If, for instance, I was, uh, I'm working with a bunch of healthcare organizations, and I say, look, if you can reduce your energy use by 50%, it means that the fuel stored in your basement lasts you for twice as long. So that's the ways in which we can start understanding the way we can leverage sustainability to really improve resilience. And when I think about resilience, I really think about the uh, capacity of the systems to accommodate change over time. It's not just the catastrophic stuff. Sometimes, you know, you don't notice climate change until you notice that all of the planting times are getting later or later, or, you know, the harvest times are getting earlier and earlier, depending on what your crop is. So sometimes it's, it's a fast change, sometimes it's a very slow change. But a resilient system is something that's really able to accommodate both of those and really help so, because of this composite searching, I guess that's what we're all doing, just searching for a composite. Um, it actually says attributes of uh, healthy, sustainable, and resilient communities. So, one of the things that becomes really interesting is um, a lot of the
the, the next three slides, so it pulls out um, uh, reports from the National Academies of Sciences and with various groups saying, how do we start thinking about what it is we're aiming towards? And so one of the elements is really thinking about um, robust economic and government systems. Right? When things go bad, you want to know that you can count on the people that are supposed to be your policemen and your firemen to actually show up and, and take care of things, but you still got property rights. And to think about vibrant and equitable social systems, because we've seen that communities that are really vibrant in their connections with people and with each other recover much more quickly and much more fully after an event. So you can see that in communities, for instance, uh, in New Orleans and um, in the areas of New York and New Jersey that got damaged by Hurricane Sandy. The communities that came back had the strong systems, had the strong social systems. When we think about um, the attributes for healthy, sustainable, and resilient infrastructure, we can, we're kind of drilling down into, if you will, this, the service side of it and the critical systems. And really thinking about, as we start looking at these clusters of human occupation, whether it's a neighborhood in a city or a small town, do we have enough, enough on-site capacity for critical services? Right, so if you have somebody on a ventilator, do you actually have the energy on site to keep that ventilator going? You know, if you've got an ICU, do you have enough energy on site, do you have enough water on site to take care of people um, in those critical conditions? And what this often means is that we can start rethinking um, the use, the effective use, and the reuse of resources. So being able to do wastewater capture treatment and on-site reuse may provide you with a critical source of water in extreme conditions. We also want to think about, if drilling down even further, and Jim's going to get into this in a lot more detail, is the attributes of healthy, sustainable, and resilient buildings. Um, this particular building is uh, one of, it's the Supreme Court building in Washington, D.C., built about 120 years ago. And it was essentially net zero when it was built. You know, you brought in a little bit of firewood into the justices' chambers in the wintertime. But other than that, you wore a sweater and, um, but you had big, beautiful windows, wonderful natural ventilation. So there's a lot of the attributes of these buildings that we can really learn from in the, um, in the system. So <clears throat> when we start thinking about um, a real framework for planning for resilience and sustainability, one of the first elements is really to understand for a community, and as I say, it could be a neighborhood, it could be a small town, it could be a bigger region, where are the critical assets and what are they? And what shape are they in? And I'll get into that in a moment. Then we really want to think about what are the vulnerabilities to extreme conditions. And remember, those could be fast moving like a flood or slow moving like increasing temperature. Then we can start to identify what are the intervention points. How do we start identifying those places that we want to focus on um, to make the biggest <coughs> impact and to have the largest uh, ripple effect in terms of the benefits? And then, um, so I'm a civil engineer, and, and a lot of what I do with communities is thinking about how do they incorporate this into every single investment in the built facility. Right? So every single time you touch a building, you should be improving its resilience and its sustainability. There is no excuse to not do that. So the critical community assets, and this is a lot of work that's come out of uh, the disaster community, disaster response and recovery, there's a whole category of what's called critical built facilities, and that's things like emergency responders, the police and the fire and the ambulances. Um, hospitals and medical care, obviously, is a really um, critical issue. Schools often become places of refuge in the community. And then in production facilities, you know, in many cases, if you don't have, um, you know, places that where bandages are made, you may not have enough bandages, right? So you have to think production facilities can also be the supply chain. The natural systems are also critical community assets. They can provide buffers, they provide critical um, services, they basically provide the, the stuff of life. And then we can look at those critical infrastructure systems, and then one of the other community assets that tend to get left behind is all of the skills and capabilities of the people in the community, right? All of those things that your people can do, that is a critical asset. And being able to recognize that and directly incorporate that in makes a big difference. Um, so, again, if that box wasn't there, what you would see is it would say, um, assess the vulnerabilities of critical assets to multi-hazard conditions. 
Right, so one of the things that becomes interesting is thinking first about proximity of, of assets to hazard zones. Um, bottom left is a, is a regional analysis I was doing, um, and those are all the municipal water treatment centers, and that's the proximity to a 100-year flood zone. Right, so you look at that and you start going, huh, well, there's, we're going to have some water problems there. Right, they get some massive flooding. Um, actually, if we figured if they got um, somewhere like more in a, um, I guess, which we call a 200 year flood, um, they would actually lose 50% of their water treatment for the whole, it's a nine count for right? um, And you can also start thinking about, okay, how are these systems interdependent with each other? So the, the um, Lower right is actually um, water, uh, natural gas, major transportation, and sewage that is all co-located together in that intersection. So you can see that you get things like the water main break that I showed you before. You can get really quickly propagating failures um, on those um, mission systems. So when we start to think about identifying the intervention points, then we can start thinking about these strategies and potential solution sets. So one of the things that is a, a really <coughs> good help um, to use as an intervention is that you can do the planning and coordination multiple scales. You can start with the building, you can work at a neighborhood, then you can take it up to the community, you can work at the region, you can keep um, working out and then coming back in again. And the more you do it at these different regions, the more strength you can get in the system overall. There's also a lot of different assets that we can talk about. There's existing built facilities as well as the new. And people tend to focus on the new ones because they're kind of fun. But the built ones are what we're going to have around with us um, in the vast majority. So there's various estimates, but basically 80% of what we've got right now is what we're going to have. Um, it's going to be, what we have now is 80% of what we will have in 20 years. Right, so we've got to take care of all the stuff we've got right now. And there's a lot of different levers. You know, when thinking about the built environment, there's day-to-day -day operations, there's maintenance and repair, there's the renewal, and then there's a lot on training that we can actually do. So I wanted to give you just one example on intervention points, and we'll let um, Jim jump up. But, um, so, uh, this was uh, one of the communities that I was working with, so it's not so different from, from Vermont. Um, it's, a, it's a beautiful, very fertile farming region. Um, there's a fairly high and growing population of dairy cows and then associated industries, yogurt and cheese making and all the rest of it, um, mostly for you know, mass market, not so much for local. Um, one of the critical issues is that this area is really vulnerable to power outages from icy storms, from high winds and all the rest of it. It's all got you know, power lines above ground that go from place to place. Each, there's a lot of small farms. When the power lines go down, the farms have no way to pump water out of the wells. Um, they have no way to get the water to their stock. They can't run their pumping machines. They can't keep their refrigerators going unless they have an on-site generator. Well, they have, but most of them have on-site generators, and they have a little bit of fuel. But some of these ice storms last for four to five days. So after those four to five days, your, your um, store of fuel may run out after, after two days, and you may not be able to get it out to get more fuel. So this issue of being having the vulnerability to power outages is huge. The other thing that's fascinating about this particular region is it has a very high population split. It has a um, very high proportion of people over 60 on these farms and a very high population of people with very small kids under the age of 80. So you've got the new generation of young farmers coming up as well as the generation that's been farming for a while. So you've got very vulnerable populations to be power outages. On a more systems level, as the dairy farms grow, there's more and more manure, which is kind of The water systems are absolutely critical for this region. It's everybody's sources of drinking water. And it is a big boon for all of the agricultural products and um, production in the area. And it's a big source of that. Right? So if they, if they poison their water, their whole economy is going to go to zero. And they're already starting to see um, nitrogen and phosphorus overloading in all the systems and eutrophication of all of the areas. So this, these issues are coming together. So one of the things I was working with them on is ways in which we can start saying, okay, look, there's a, there's a way of thinking about that waste. And every, every physical manifestation is a form of energy. 
right? So all that poop, it's energy. And you want to think about what's the best way of getting that energy back out, particularly on small uh, farms, right? So there's a lot of huge, you know, anaerobic digesters. But if you start having to truck the um, cow manure all over the place, you, you run into expected problems of delivery and we're not doing it. Right, so one of the things that we were talking about was that there's actually um, some new technologies that are coming out and thinking about totally different ways of thinking about this manure as an incredible resource. So one of the things is there's a whole new set of technologies that are commercially available where you can pre-process the manure and pull out all the nitrogen and phosphorus. And you actually get it in a um, solid pelletized form, which is much better for fertilizer than commercial fertilizer. It's much less likely to have runoff, and it's much easier for the plants to do uptake. So what we've got is this pile of manure. All of a sudden, we pull out the nitrogen and the phosphorus. We've got a new revenue stream for our farmer. Right, but we're not done yet. What we're also going to do is pull it through and pull off all the fat oils and grease. And there's a number of new companies which are starting off that do a direct translation from fat oils and grease to biodiesel. And what's nice about both of these is that they both work at small scales, like a small farm scale. Then the third thing we can do is, so now we've got the, the um, manure. We've pulled out the nitrogen and phosphorus. We've pulled out the fat oils and grease. Right now what we do is we send what's left into a microbial fuel cell. And a microbial fuel cell is, is basically a bunch of really, really happy bacteria. And happy bacteria, when they um, digest organic matter, put off an electric charge. And so a microbial fuel cell, what you do is you feed the liquid organic waste in, and you get electricity and pure H2O out. <laughs> so all of a sudden, it shifts up the whole way of thinking about this. And they're all, the units that are out right now are small scale enough, so you can have this on a farm. You know, you have 10 cows, you buy one. You have 500 cows, you buy a whole bunch of them. So as we start rethinking this, it really provides us a way to rethink this whole system. Um, there's also all sorts of other types of interventions that can be at larger scale. The one on the, on the right hand side is the Dallas uh, Trinity River Quarter. They took a large river area that was constantly flooding and causing everybody problems and somebody said, hey, why don't we make a park? So they did and they created this huge park through the center of Dallas which also acts as a buffer area whenever there's a flood. And it's protected everybody on either side. On the left hand side, the um, Europeans have come up with this wonderful system which is basically they've, they've planted all of their tramways, not with stones and rocks and the rest of it, but with grass, so that you can actually like, walk on it. And, that's nice. um, and as we start thinking about those kinds of green infrastructure options, there's ways of not only dealing with the stormwater, but also improving air quality and providing beautiful places where people get to play. So it's kind of a, a win in all areas. Um, and so these are the things that, that I feel are the real call to action to really think about, okay, now how do we start planning for resilience and sustainability and absolutely everything we do? And it's got to take collaboration with all of our neighbors. If this is not, you know, one person charging off or somebody telling everybody else. There's got to be collaboration because there's so many system interdependencies. And these vulnerabilities are going to change over time. We don't really know what's going to go. And so I just want to give you an example. So Soldiers uh, Grove, Wisconsin. So the picture that I started up with, that kind of nice patterny green thing, that's actually a satellite image of Soldiers Grove, Wisconsin. My sister lives out there on her farm. In 1951, there was a flood, top left picture, flooded the whole city. Now they barely recovered. They managed to rebuild everything. You know, basically all the houses were destroyed. They had to rebuild everything. They rebuilt. Then they had a couple of other smaller floods. And finally they decided, okay, maybe what we want to do is we want to try and move. But they couldn't get permission from the federal agencies to move. And they were negotiating for six years. And they said, no, look, we've got somebody who will actually sell us the land on the hill. We want to be able to move. They finally got permission. But before anybody could move, they got hit by the 1978 flood. And they lost everything. You can see, you know, it's basically up to the ceilings of the first floor rooms. Um, that top right hand picture is Soldiers Grove now. Everything is solar power, uh, passive solar, um, all sorts of events, on-site energy generation. They restructured the whole town so it's totally walkable. Um, in 07, 2007, there was a massive flood in the area. And Gaze Mills, which is just down the river from them, 
basically looked like the 1951 flood. You know, it basically was up to the roofs of all the houses. Um, Soldiers Grove was not touched. So that's an example of a community that really is thinking in long term about where do they want to be, how do they create the most effective community spaces that can really um, provide sustainability but also provide that resilience over time. And now I'm going to let you go. So those are sustainability resources. <laughs> uh, so uh, we'll be pretty fast. Uh, um, start back there. Uh, and then you can, there's plenty of opportunity to ask crazy questions. Uh, you know, so our, our, my thought is really more about how do you, how do you take this to buildings? Because we all deal a lot with buildings, right? So how do, you, how do you make buildings stronger? And how do you know, right? What do we know about? Well, we know we have to be thinking about ecosystems. We know we have to be thinking about building energy. The risks associated with, with energy are huge. We use so much energy in our buildings. We have to be looking at uh, what the effects of our development are. And uh, we also have to, there's a, there's a thing that says contaminated sites off on the far side there. Um, so now, the, the, we know that this stuff's real. We're in the middle of it, right? So some of this is, is Irene, some of it's Sandy. Uh, my, my fave was uh, currently is uh, the gas explosion in Taiwan last week. Uh, There's an explosion on a street in Taiwan where the gas main was leaking gas into the sewer main and somehow it started on fire and the whole street exploded. And there are pictures of this with fire trucks lying on their sides who had arrived to fight the fire and been exploded and tossed up in the air and landed on their side. It's crazy. It's like this stuff happens all this time. Uh, what was the, uh, the water main break in, in LA? Uh, 20 million gallons of water spread all over the street in UCLA. Uh, and this, you know, that piece of the city is now out of water for two weeks and they're scrambling to figure out, okay, what do we do about water? Uh, we do this stuff to ourselves. We don't even, we don't even need a, a hurricane to do it to us. So some of this stuff came out of this report that, uh, that I, I run a little uh, consulting company called Lanan Solutions. We do this kind of work and we also do a lot of sort of ecosystem uh, tracking. Um, uh, so my company, Lanan, uh, Sarah's uh, uh, organization, the Built Environment Coalition, and then Alex Wilson's uh, organization, the Resilient Design Institute, worked on this report together. Uh, some of this comes from that, some of it comes from other things. Uh, it's available for free. If you Google build, building, resi building resilience in Boston, uh, you'll find about 16 copies of it out there. Uh, well worth taking a look at. Uh, and what the heck, three. Um, so now, as we know here, you start thinking about your place. What do we know about our place? So we're looking at Boston, there's the Charles River, there's the bay, you know, all this stuff. Here's the Neponset River. This is actually the Charles down here, it goes up and goes back around. Um, and then we have, you know, so you take each different spot and they're all kind of different, right? You get up there in Somerville by the, by the Alewife, uh, down here in the harbor. Here is uh, sort of Dorchester. This is Dedham, down by the Charles River. Now what happens if you look at this Dedham zone, right, which is a little bit more like here, what does this look like? So this is population density. This is heat island effect on a sort of census tract level. So where is it the hottest and where is it the coolest? You can see. This is wind hazards. This is where the wind is the strongest in these areas. Uh, and then this is the flood maps. So you now you get to see, you start to see where do these things add up? Where are things stacked up? Where do you run into that process of, uh, of hazards and assets that Sarah was talking about? So in this case, this is part of that, that question about what's our responsibility as designers, as builders? 
This is a building that is a block outside the 100 year flood zone in Fort Point Channel in, in Boston. A block. It's like, oh, that block's going to make a big difference. This is their basement height. This is the uh, current sort of sea level. This is the um, mean high sea level. This is where Sandy came to in Boston. This is where Sandy came to in New York. Now Boston, you know, Sandy hit Boston five or six hours before high tide. Uh, so the, the theory is if, if Sandy had hit Boston six hours later, we would have had the same damage that they had in New York. Not totally sure on that, but it certainly would have been much worse. Uh, these guys, unfortunately, this is their basement. Was redone. This building was redone eight years ago. They have a fabulous electrical panel that's beautifully put together. <laughs> this is approximately two feet below the 100 year flood level. Uh, this is right outside the building. The, the first time I went to this building to look at it, there were actually sandbags around this thing. <laughs> this is their transformer, right? This is not theirs, it belongs to NSTAR, but it speeds that building. Uh, you know, that stuff, you get any kind of flood, all of that's knocked out. So these guys are now, they don't have to design to a higher flood level. Uh, but they're scared. This is an architect's office. These guys are scared. They're like, what are we going to do? We've got this asset, you know, 15 years from now, this thing's going to be half underwater. We better get rolling. So they asked us to come in and give them some plans and some ideas about how to fix it. Um, so uh, one of the things we talked about is, well, how do you, what are you looking for, right? And, and how do you think about doing temporary flood barriers? Because they're not going to move their electrical panel up to the first floor. They just put it in. It would cost them a million bucks to do it. Forget it. So what are you going to do? Talk about some temporary flood barriers. Uh, and then we also looked at uh, temperature and what are their energy needs. So here's energy demand in cold weather. This is looking at energy demand in cold weather, right? So in Boston, this is all natural gas heating. Nice curve. Uh, if you look at energy demand, electricity demand in warm weather, right? This is electricity demand. This is uh, natural gas and cooling. Heating is natural gas. Cooling is electricity. Uh, you don't. See, there's not a big difference, right? So you're not seeing a big uh, um, seasonal shift in energy and electricity demand. So you can't say. What you can say is, well, these guys are woefully under insulated. That's obvious. So there's step one. But you can't say, well, you know, that insulation really plays out in cooling. It's like, eh, it doesn't really. It's like, you can't tell. So, on the other hand, they spend about $280,000 a year in electricity. So, one of the things we suggested to them was put in uh, a CHP system, a 75 kilowatt CHP system uh, on the roof. What, why bother? Why bother doing that? First, provides a little extra backup power. They have a failover system. They have a beautiful failover system, a really nice, sweet looking uh, uh, backup generator. In the uh, It is beautiful. Uh, oh, and the oil tanks in the basement. Um, uh, but put in, so. Provide some extra backup power. If that, if for some reason, that backup power gets nailed, then you've got some more. The second thing is, it, you know, it takes care of some of that heat, right? We saw that heat was an issue. So I have to take care of some of that heat. The third thing is, you can use this for demand response. So, is anybody familiar with the concept of demand response? Something you guys run into? Okay, so us, us urbanites, uh, um, in, uh, in many urban settings, uh, electricity, especially for larger customers, uh, you pay a rate 
it's our base rate for your electricity, and then you pay a rate that is determined by your maximum demand on a certain day of the year. Uh, and that's a special demand charge. And so, uh, on, usually it's a really hot day in the middle of the summer in July, and they pick your, at 4 o'clock in the afternoon, what's your rate? And you pay a demand charge based on that. So you can actually, there are programs in cities all around the country where you can turn things off when the demand is the highest, and the utility will pay you handsomely because it's so expensive for them to fire up those extra peak power power stations. So that's called demand response. So you can use this thing for demand response. So now, wait a second. You get some extra heat, which is a problem for you. You've got some extra backup power, because the backup power currently is slightly problematic and also is not going to be a ton of power. And you can make money on this thing using it for demand response. You can probably pay for it in a couple of years through that demand response action. This is a no-brainer. In a slightly larger system, this is Princeton. Princeton has this big gas-fired uh, cogen system, does a lot of heat, 80%, uh, uh, I can't remember how much, but anyway, does a bunch of heat for the campus and uh, generates a bunch of electricity. Uh, this is what happened um, in, there's a three-day power outage uh, where the grid went down, and this is what happened. So, this is their generation, this is their use, this is the power outage. This is what happened. Their generation handled the use. Oh, power came back on. Now they're separated again. Princeton was one of the few uh, institutions in the area that had power. Now, wait a second. Look, big deal. Students have power. That's cool. What else does Princeton have? Experiments. They have a ton of experiments. They got all these Bavarians. They got all these crazy chemicals and things going on that you really don't want to go down. Okay. You don't want the power to go off in those things. So it's key that they have this stuff there. The flip side of that is the, uh, is the, um, the sort of uh, residential side of it. This is um, Alex Wilson's uh, inverter. It's called a Sunny Boy. And... Uh, <laughs> keep it down. Uh, and that is the receptacle. So, when the power goes, when the grid goes down, uh, this is sort of a crude version of this. There are fancier versions, but they're kind of expensive. When the power goes down, he can plug his refrigerator into that receptacle. It's got a little battery that flattens out the, the uh, power generation. And he can run his refrigerator and a couple other things off of this thing and the solar panels when the grid goes down. Is there a switch? Yeah, and actually the switch, it, it's an internal switch that does it on yeah. um, there You can do this, in a, it, you can, it, this, this technology is moving very quickly. This is happening very quickly right now. Uh, we're looking at one which is very similar, uh, where actually the, much more of the system can run into a failover that just automatically flips over and runs some piece of your house. <coughs> I can tell you, we haven't figured out using the electrical, electric car as the battery yet. Okay. Um, and then, so, so this is just a, an example of another version of this, which is something that we worked on in Boston. Uh, it's an alley uh, behind the BAC uh, off of uh, Newbury Street. Uh, so it's pretty urban, uh, very paved. Um, and so there's, there's a project to, uh, they actually put in, the, the whole project is fabulous. They put in eight ground source heat pump wells in the alley, in the public alley, that serve the two BAC buildings plus the fire station plus three other buildings on the alley. So a little mini microgrid of heat. Uh, they're in the alley. That's the big fancy part of it. But they also redid the alley to allow water infiltration through from all of the buildings in the area. So it's about 5,000 square foot alley uh, plus another 20,000 square foot of roof. 
uh, that is fed in through that alley. All that water goes into a, a sort of a drainage system under the alley and then just drains into the aquifer below, uh, below the street. Now Boston has some very specific characteristics about that. Uh, the back bay, um, the water table in the back bay has been dropping for 100 years since it sort of got created. Uh, and uh, partially it's because it's so heavily paved uh, that water isn't getting in there. <clears throat> Who cares if the water table is dropping? And there's also a wall, there's a dam in between that bay and the, the river, which a lot of people don't really understand, but that keeps water from the river from refilling the, the water table in the back bay. Um, what's the big deal? Well, all those beautiful brick buildings in the back bay are built on wooden piers. As the water table goes down, the tops of those wooden piers start to hit air and rot. So, if the water table gets below a certain level, which we're sort of, we sort of flirt with currently, <laughs> within about 10 years, those buildings will have to be torn down and rebuilt. We're talking about the whole back bay. This is not, oh, we might have to spend a couple million dollars. You know, this is billions of dollars worth of repair and real estate. So, put this thing in, it was a test for the city to see if they could do this on essentially all of the, the, uh, the alleys in the city, in the back bay. Um, what happened was actually kind of interesting. So, this thing is it's pretty heavily designed, it's nicely done, it's a whole dry well, perforated pipe thing, but one of the things it has, it has overflows into the, to the storm sewer system. Now, this part of the storm sewer system in Boston is still combined. It still combines storm water with sewer water. Uh, most cities in America have that. Boston uh, has been through a major process to separate them, which was a huge deal. But some parts are still combined, and this is one part. So uh, this is flow. This is flow on the two <coughs> overflow pipes uh, going from this alley to the stormwater, storm sewer system, right? So what we're looking at is how much water is escaping this alley into the storm sewer system. Essentially, the alley controls 100% of the storm. So what happens? We go along, this is rain. This is, uh, what, two weeks ago? About two weeks ago when we had, this is the 30th, the 28th of July. We had uh, that crazy storm where we got uh, an inch and a quarter or so over the course of about an hour and a half. Uh, flood, it was flooding everything. What happened? So this actually is negative flow. This is positive flow. This is negative flow. What happened? This green alley took water from the storm sewer system, but was a buffer for the storm sewer system, then gave back a little bit of that water and then took it, took water again for the storm sewer system after it filled in. And then nothing. Total flow, uh, it was about 50,000 gallons of water fell on a 20,000 square feet or something like that, 25,000 square feet. Uh, I think 186 gallons, literally, overflowed into the storm sewer system in total. So essentially this is completely handless, this storm. Uh, this is a huge thing. Why do we care? Well, we care because it's saving the back bay water table. We care because when those things overflow, they overflow into the Charles River. These are over CSO points on the Charles River. This one, this is the one, uh, the, these ones are ones that, that overflow sewage into the Charles. Mm. So if this thing doesn't work, that excess storm water is overflowing the storm sewer system and Stormwater and sewage are flowing into the charts. So, uh, this is sort of talking about municipal strategies. I'm going to start to look through that. Um, so, really, this is about hey, we're professionals in this room. This is our responsibility. We've got to be thinking about this stuff. You have to understand the potential hazards. You've got to understand what assets are out there, what you're working with. And you got to understand 
how to incorporate the concepts of resilience into your work now. I think that's it.